First, I wanted to thank uh, the Staglin family and IMRO and the Scientific Advisory Board, uh, not only for the wonderful award, which is going to help support my research for the next three years, but also for bringing me out here on a beautiful day to Napa. And thank you, everyone who's here, not just to hear me, but also to support this fantastic organization. I'm happy to talk about this more in depth in detail later. But suffice it to say, it's difficult to get funding for uh, some of the work that we do in our lab um, because it's new and original. And it's really wonderful to have organizations like IMRO that's willing to take a risk on something in the beginning. Um, it's also, I also want to thank Pat Levitt for introducing the notion of neurodevelopmental disorder uh, as underlying most of what we think about as, as psychiatric disorders. Um, and I'm going to build on that, though, by approaching it from the point of view of the organism that is fully developed. So I study uh, animal models of these psychiatric illnesses, and particularly in mice. And I come at it from the perspective of, okay, we've gone through the developmental processes. We know that the brain has been insulted by genetics and by uh, environment. And, um, and in the end, mental illness is a, an illness of behavior. Uh, and when I say behavior, I also mean thought and emotion. And what my interest is trying to understand what are the brain processes that underlie those abnormalities in behavior. And, and fortunately, using the genetic cues, using the environmental cues, and using knowledge from patients, we actually know a fair bit about the circuitry. And what I'm trying to really understand is the nitty gritty of how it all works together. So I want to start with this image of the human brain in which two brain regions have been highlighted. One in orange here, if you can make it out in the sun, is the hippocampus. And the other one in blue is the prefrontal cortex. Now, the hippocampus is widely known to most people, actually, because it's been in the popular press. It's the center of the brain that's really important for memory. What people don't realize as much, except maybe many of you in the audience, is the hippocampus is also really important for emotion. So, and we know that primarily from patient work, where one of the most robust findings in mental illness is that we have a smaller hippocampus whether we're depressed or whether we have schizophrenia. So we know that this brain region plays an important role in both emotional and cognitive processes. By cognition, I mean memory and other processes like it. The, uh, the other structure, the prefrontal cortex, which is right out here in the front of our brain, also plays an important role in these same emotional and cognitive processes. And we also know that from patient literature as well as from human imaging data. And the other thing we know is that these two brain regions talk to each other throughout these processes. Um, we know some of that from human literature and we know some of it from animal literature. And I'm happy to talk about it in, in, in more detail, but I'm gonna tell you two brief stories from my own work that, uh, that demonstrate the notion that these two brain regions are talking to each other during the functions that we know are abnormal in uh, psychiatric disease. And to do that, though, I'm going to have to introduce these brain structures now in the rodent. As Pat mentioned, the rodent doesn't have much of a prefrontal cortex, but it does have one. But it does have an extensive hippocampus. It's much larger compared to the uh, compared to the rest of the size of the brain. And that hippocampus is, is divided into two parts, um, a, what's called a dorsal part, meaning it's up near the top of the, of the mouse's brain, and a more ventral part that's down near the bottom. And we know that the dorsal hippocampus, from all kinds of different studies, is involved more in thought and cognition and memory, um, and that the ventral part is more involved in emotion. But both of these regions must talk to the medial prefrontal cortex to carry out most of the tasks that the animals do that are relative to emotion and cognition. And one, although it's unclear exactly what the role of the medial prefrontal cortex is in mediating these behaviors, one of the ideas that we have is that the medial prefrontal cortex is involved in general decision making and planning. And so it uses information, cognitive information from the dorsal hippocampus and emotional information from the ventral hippocampus to carry out a broad range of tasks to decide what you're gonna do for the day. And if you think about it, those of you who know patients with mental illness, I, I have in my family and I treat in my practice, this is what they have a lot of trouble with. They have a lot of trouble properly using emotional and cognitive information to make decisions and plan their lives. And um, so how do we study this in a rodent? What I do is actually 
take mice and I put electrodes into these brain structures, allow the mice to recover from the surgery, and then allow them to navigate and do cognitive and emotional tasks. And I ask, what is happening in those brain regions to the neural activity, the activity of the neurons that Pat was talking about while they're doing these behaviors? And we can learn some interesting things. And one of the things that, that we've been focusing on lately is, as I mentioned, that these brain regions talk to each other. And so we want to know, we want to be able to measure how they talk to each other. We can do that by recording activities. This is really dark in here, but hopefully you can see it. If not, just follow the bouncing green light. To do that, we look at activity in one brain region, and it tends to go up and down as an animal moves around through its world. And so we ask, well, when brain activity is going up and down in one brain region, how about in another brain region? So if activity in the hippocampus, in this case, is going up and down, what's happening to the prefrontal cortex, neurons? And what we find is when activity is in one phase, in this case down in the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortical neurons are up. And we can demonstrate then that the timing of activity in the prefrontal cortex is dependent upon the timing in the hippocampus. That is, the hippocampus is telling the prefrontal cortical neurons, fire, be active, or silent. And it's doing it over time. And so we can measure that process over time and we can ask, how much is the prefrontal cortex actually listening to the hippocampus? And how much is the prefrontal cortex listening to the cognitive part of the hippocampus as opposed to the emotional part of the hippocampus? We do that, as I said, while the animals are performing behavioral tasks. One of the behavioral tasks we use is a maze where there are two open arms and two closed arms, and mice naturally like closed spaces. You know this if you've had a mouse in your kitchen, they run around the edges of the walls. And so mice will avoid the open arms and spend most of the time in the closed arms. And we use that as a measure of how nervous or how anxious they are in their environment. So it's an emotional behavior. And what we show here, you can ignore the, the titles, what we show here is that the rhythm of the medial prefrontal cortical neurons is more dominated by the ventral hippocampal input, this is a bigger up and down, when the animal is anxious than when it's in a control environment. So we can show that the hippocampus, the emotional part of the hippocampus in this case, is talking to the medial prefrontal cortex when the animal is anxious. And we can actually track that throughout the maze and show you that the Areas stop talking to each other just when the animal decides, you know what, it's okay, I'm going to go out and explore those open arms. So the, it's as if the medial prefrontal cortex is making a decision, am I going to go out there, am I going to look on those open arms and see what goodies might be out there, or am I going to be too anxious and not go out and explore? And this is an analogy for the anxiety patient, right, who is so riddled with anxiety that she can't leave her house. Right? And it, maybe it's because the ventral hippocampus is talking too much to the medial prefrontal cortex. That's pure hypothesis at this point. But the fact is that we can monitor these things online in the animals and then look for similar things in humans. The next short story that I want to tell you is a similar process, but now looking at cog cognitive processes and memory in a, model, a mouse model of schizophrenia. So here we have a, a different kind of behavioral task, a task where the animal has to remember that it went left in a, a T-shaped maze, and then the next time it's exposed to that maze, it has to go back the other direction. It's called a non-matched sample task. The animal has to go back to the right next time. It has to use working memory, that is, hold online the information that where it went before to be able to go to the other side. And this kind of task is very difficult for patients with schizophrenia. And both in humans and in rodents, it relies on the communication between the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. So we took a mouse model which carries one of these genes, a copy number variant that Pat mentioned, which predisposes to schizophrenia, makes people with this gene have a 30% chance of getting the illness instead of only a 1% chance. And we ask, are these brain regions talking to each other during this working memory task in the mutant? And we find that the strength of, of the communication between the hippocampus is lower in the schizophrenia mutant than in the wild-type mice. And so our interpretation of that is that these mice can't perform working memory tasks as well as their wild-type litter mates because they have a mutation that is preventing these two brain regions from talking to each other. So that's the setup for my work that is going to be funded by the Rising Star Award. And what, what we plan to do now over the next several years is to ask within this circuit what exactly is going on in anxiety, in working memory, and, and uh, when 
and in my carrying mutations, which alter anxiety-like behaviors and alter working memory-like behaviors, that results in the, um, the, the, the communication problems that we see. We, in order to do that, we need to know how does the information flow from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. There's various pathways through the brain. So part of the project, we're going to be looking at which pathways are important for communication from the emotional hippocampus to the medial prefrontal cortex, and which pathways are important for communication between the cognitive hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. We want to know, can we block this communication? Can we interrupt those pathways, maybe to reduce abnormal communication that's seen in anxiety? Or can we enhance it? Can we increase the throughput, say, from the cognitive hippocampus to the medial prefrontal cortex in order to enhance working memory in mice? And so that's the plan. And these are some of the people that are going to be carrying out, people in my lab. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank, of course, again, the Imro Foundation for, for really uh, allowing me to get this work off the ground.